Okay, sorry, continue. <laughs> um, so this topic of the um, communicating the importance of, of scientific, the significance of scientific findings is actually a really critical part of what it means to be a scientist. Um, and so scientists in training are taught that it's important to um, you know, conduct research that is rigorous and reproducible, but it's also equally important that you know how to communicate the, the findings and also um, the, the significance that it contributes to your field. And so scientists do, have, do this in many different ways. Um, they can publish their findings on open access servers um, as preprints like bioarchive. Um, they can publish their findings through the peer review process in a journal. Um, scientists share their work in the form of posters um, at meetings, or they can talk about their work as a panelist at a conference, for example. Um, and they can also take to um, social media platforms such as Twitter um, or ResearchGate um, to communicate their findings. Um, but this leads to the question of, um, is this contributing in any way to um, other um, observations that have been made through empirical evidence about um, differences, the different experiences that women scientists have compared to men um, when it comes to, for example, the rate at which women scientists submit funding um, and also the way that in which there have been differences that have been noted through um, these sort of retrospective studies about how women are often um, tend to be judged more on their perceived um, their perceived um, capabilities as a scientist rather than the proposed, um, the proposed work. Um, so rather it's more tied to them as an individual person rather than the proposed quali the quality of the proposed research. Um, it's also been noted that women are less likely to um, voice questions or speak up or be invited as panelists um, at scientific conferences. Um, and so um, the authors of this paper that I mentioned earlier, wanted to see if um, differences in how the significance of published work uh, might be contributing in any way to any of these other observations. Um, but when you look at some gender invariants that have been noted in these studies is the fact that um, scientists of different genders um, you know, are equally successful in their fields. Um, it just kind of boils down to um, what the other speakers have, um, um, Banu and Kat have talked about so far is that um, it's, it's gender specific dropout rates that impact the, lawn, the, the longitude, um, what I should say, the length of um, a scientist's career in which they're publishing more papers and have the opportunity to be cited more in their work and establish their network. Um, so if the environment itself is hostile and forcing out um, in a, in a gender specific way, um, individuals from, if we wanna keep using the STEM pipeline analogy, um, these dropout rates are going to happen in different ways, depending on the gender of the individual. Um, and so um, we have made great strides in the, field, in the field of STEM in trying to address you know, where the leaks are happening in the pipeline. Um, and so I, I feel like we have come a long way in talking about how we can improve things at this earlier end of the pipeline. So getting more young people involved in STEM related educational programs um, is has really been gaining a, a lot of um, attention and popularity. Um, but still the attrition rate is occurring at the switch to um, independence, um, a more senior, um, you know, early investigator role is where the attrition rate of women scientists is greatest. Um, and it could be that it has something to do with how as scientists are um, pri um, uh, principal investigators as they're developing their own labs research program, um, it's important how they communicate what they can bring to the table and what they can bring to their field. Um, and so people in trying to look more into this have um, looked at um, how uh, women scientists interact with um, other scientists on social media platforms such as Twitter to talk about their work. And so this one study in 2019, um, they were able to use the Twitter analytics platform to uh, look at the activity of uh, the Twitter profiles of 
um, people that were attending this uh, medical health professionals conference in 2018. And so they took those um, conference participants and they looked at their Twitter profiles and also the profiles of their followers. And they found that on average, um, Twitter accounts that were held by um, women scientists um, generated fewer uh, likes and retweets on their post. Um, and they also tended to attract um, less followers. And for women scientists, they tended to be followed by other women um, and rather than men. Um, so there was a uneven distribution in you know, the composition of, of the followers. Um, and this was independent of their act taking into account the activity of that of, uh, Twitter account holder. Um, and the, these differences, they found that um, were greatest um, among as um, uh, the individual's career um, progressed. Um, so full professors, this difference was much more significant. Um, and then there was this other interesting case study that I had found that was done in um, a cohort of individuals that were sampled in Switzerland in a few, a few years ago, but I still thought it was interesting because I think it probably car carries true to today. Um, and that was that they surveyed um, the attitude that scientists have towards the importance of working with um, public media and you know, outlets that interface with the general public and how they feel, you know, how important it is that you communicate your work uh, to the general public. And so they found that amongst men and women scientists, they both shared um, an equal attitude that it is important to be engaged with public media. Um, however, they did find that it, when it came to the engagement that the scientists actually had with social media, um, with public media, um, men scientists tended to be more engaged and tended to be reached out more to um, by these media outlets compared to women. Um, and so this is really important because uh, this is going to affect the representation of what a scientist looks like um, to the general public and to other people who want to be, become involved in science. Uh, in science. Um, and so this leads me to talk a little bit more about the, the paper I keep talking about. Um, and so their main question was they wanted to see if there were gender-based differences in how scientists um, talk about their research in the form of papers. Um, and um, in this case, they were looking at the frequency and the context of certain words that have a positive connotation. Um, so I'm gonna first walk you through how they got their data set for this study. Um, and so over the period of 2002 to 2017, uh, they compiled um, a number of clinical research articles and general life science primary research articles. And they um, calculated the probability of the gender of the, uh, of the author forenames for the first and last authors. And they used this, um, there are many algorithms out there to do this, um, but they used genderized because they felt that it was um, the most efficient. And um, one issue here is that again, they're, they're conflating sex of the, um, so names, they are assuming that the names have a sex as male or female, um, and they're using this to assume the gender of that scientist as, as a woman or a man. Um, and they then uh, took these papers and they collected information about the journal impact factor. And then they also categorized these papers according to their mesh um, keywords, which is a keyword that's um, assigned to papers by a professional uh, science librarian. So these are not determined by the scientists that are publishing the paper. This is in an effort to remove bias. Um, and then from here, they used a linear probability model to um, look at a number of different, um, uh, to do a number of analysis. And they um, considered the year of publication and the journal um, that the paper was published in, um, as well as the different keywords to control for differences in language that are field, uh, field specific. Um, and also we know that there's trends in the differences in how people communicate about their work over time. Um, and then they also looked at how, you know, changes in the composition of the authorship could have an impact on their analysis um, and so on. So I, these were different things that they took into consideration. Um, so to get their criteria for looking at positive language, they referenced this earlier study that was looking at um, trends in um, papers pub, um, indexed on PubMed about how over time there has been an increase in the number of 
of positively associated words in um, in, in published uh, scientific literature. Um, so and so examples of these words are on the side here, um, such as groundbreaking and you know robust and um, promising and so on. And so the frequency at which people are using these words and including them in published literature is increasing. So they took this list of words and they applied it to their data set, and they too found that the similar trend in that over time. Uh, the frequency of these words is um, increasing um, and um, in both clinical and general science uh, journals. Um, they then looked to see in their data set what proportion of the papers um, satisfied the criteria of having at least one of these positive words. Um, and so, ooh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, maybe I can switch to pointer. Um, here we go. Um, and so about 12% of their papers um, satisfied the criteria of including at least one of these positive words. And so they used this for their subsequent analysis. So they also looked to see what proportion of the papers um, were written by um, author pairs that had, had first and last authors that had um, female forenames. Um, and so compared to um, all male uh, author pairs, um, this um, was uh, significantly less um, compared to all male author pairs. Um, and then so from here, um, they then ranked the uh, prevalence of these different positive words um, across uh, the papers. Um, and they found that, um, so novel, for example, was uh, the word that appeared most frequently and was used most often in these papers. Um, and they found, interestingly, that um, novel tended to be used um, uh, more often than uh, author pairs that had at least one male compared to uh, author pairs that were both female, uh, female first and last authors. Um, and this was looking at um, the appearance of these words in both the, um, the title and the abstract of the papers. And they focused on this section of the paper because they felt this was the most important part that um, would determine a reader if they should continue reading the paper or not. Um, and then, um, so they observed that the, uh, the, the frequency of the usage of these words differed according to um, the author pair composition. Um, and this is here just another um, a, an analysis that they did with their data. After um, this Poisson regression, they found that uh, um, all female author pairs tended to use pos these positive words 40% less often compared to author pairs that had at least one male. Um, they then were, were looked to see if there was a difference in the context or the way that the authors were using um, these words. Um, and so they took advantage of the fact that clinical medical um, articles are divided very cleanly into these different sections, such as background methods, results, and conclusions. And they found that, um, so this is a, a heat map showing the, um, the frequency um, at which these words appeared in these different sections. And they found that um, they tended to appear most often in the results and conclusions sections. Um, but when they looked at if there was a relationship with the assumed author um, gender, um, there was no difference between the groups. So taking into consideration this data with the previous data that was on um, that I just spoke about, um, this suggests that um, the context that the words are being used, um, there does not appear to be a difference, um, but the frequency is, is there is a difference there. Um, and this is just demonstrating how they um, did this analysis. And so they took each of the positive words in their set and they um, used this natural language um, this natural language processing algorithm to look at the nouns surrounding the word and they didn't find a difference um, between author, um, and, um, authored, um, author pairs um, in how the context of the words were being used. Um, and then when they varied the stringency of their gender designation threshold, um, they originally used a 90% gender designation threshold to assume the, um, the uh, author gender. Um, the, this, really, this, this effect um, uh, uh, was still um, held um, with, when they um, reduced the stringency. Um, but I'm gonna talk on the next slide about how this difference um, is most highest in journals with impact factors of greater than 10. Um, and um, this is kind of redundant, but this is just showing how um, 
the difference in the frequency of these words um, was uh, was um, the frequency is last when they look at um, author pairs that are female female compared to um, mixed gender and all male. Um, and so I had mentioned on the slide before this um, that they noticed that there was this um, that the, the difference was greatest with amongst papers that were in journals with impact factors of greater than ten. Um, and so this is um, this is interesting. Um, and they um, then found this relationship between how um, papers that had a higher frequency of the appearance of these positive words, um, they tended to be to um, be cited more frequently. Um, and this difference was um, most significant in journals of impact factors that were greater than 10. Um, so the authors were arguing that um, there is a direct, you know, translatable effect of the use of positive language words in um, in signed in, in a in a published paper that can have direct um, a readout effect on how it's received and how it can be perceived by your peers. Um, and so, just to summarize briefly, um, what I've told you from the study was that um, they found that the uh, the context in which this limited set of positive words um, didn't seem to differ uh, between fields and um, between um, gender compositions of the authors, uh, but they did find that there was, um, they found that um, female author pairs um, use these words uh, way less frequently than um, mixed auth um, gender author pairs and all male author pairs. Um, and they didn't find that, uh, they did find that this difference was greatest in high impact journals, um, and this could have an effect on how many citations the paper could receive down the line. Um, and so some things that um, are food for thought in light of the study um, is that perhaps um, men and women scientists are held to different um, standards during the um, journal evaluation process uh, because we have to take in, into account that the articles that were used in the study were published. And so it'd be interesting to know if these differences still hold at the article submission stage. Um, and so it's possible that um, women are critiqued differently um, during the peer review process. And this could have an effect on the final manuscript. Um, and um, the authors also raise the possibility that men could be content to conduct research in more quote unquote high risk or novel areas um, where the usage of these words would be more frequent. Um, and also they acknowledge that they were only looking at 25 words as to select for papers for further analysis. And so it's possible that if they increased um, the number of these positive words, um, the effect that they're seeing um, could be far greater. Um, and again, as we've talked about earlier um, with Kat, that there is a lot of problems um, with assuming um, the gender, um, especially in this binary way um, from author four names. Um, and so it is really important that we understand more of the demographic information that's associated with, um, with, uh, with scientists. Um, and so I just want to give this example of, you know, if you're at your favorite Cold Spring Harbor conference um, and you're thinking about how you're pre presenting the importance of your work, um, sometimes it is important to use um, certain words um, to communicate to other people that, you know, the, 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 the results that you have to share are, are meaningful in the context of, of your field. Um, and so, um, it is a really nuanced topic, um, but it's it's an interesting thing to think about about how this could be it could really be having an effect on how um, scientists are perceived by their peers, um, and it could affect you know how their uh, skill sets that they have um, are 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 perceived by um, by other people. Um, so thank you for your um, attention. Um, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to try and answer them. And again, uh, a pop, oh, I think I stopped my sharing. Um, there we go. Um, I also can't see anyone anymore. Let me try and get the camera back. Okay, there we go. Um, 
Yeah, thank you for your for your attention. And I again, apologies, I didn't have my notes with me. So there are some other things I wanted to say, but I couldn't quite remember. No, that was that was great, Nicole. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. I think that your presentation kind of encapsulates a lot of uh, one of the, I'd say the primary goal of the in-house education retreat is to kind of arm ourselves with this knowledge because I think um, it's become more uh, appreciated as the study had pointed to about how important the nomenclature and your vernacular are on, you know, your impact and your, the perceived uh, quality of your work. Sorry, I switched my camera back around. Uh, the perceived quality of your work and stuff. And so I think that like that take home lesson of keep that in mind and especially for, for women in science that there's an inherent tendency to maybe not push as hard for that and maybe to do so in the future and it could have a really positive impact on your career. Um, I don't see any questions posted in chat yet, uh, but we can wait for a second. I, I did have one comment to make though, is I, I think the best point of this might've been that when they looked at um, the frequency in which they were used per section, kind of normalizing to that, because it, 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 to me that just normalizes that it's not that they're using them in different places or this or that, it's that they are consistently using them more frequently. Like the, the normalization methods that they use seem to be good. Um, but I do agree with some of your, your takeaways of the potential pitfalls of like assuming gender four names. And then also I think the most interesting pit, potential pitfall of the study that you brought up was um, that these are all published and maybe it's important to look at you know, I hope a study comes one day that looks more at, at the paper submission level, or you could even do bioarchive, I suppose, um, something like that. But then bioarchive is still conflating uh, bias towards uh, whether you're submitting preprints, who knows what bias comes there if, if you really start to think about it. But yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, Dr. Abate asked, did anyone look at differences in language for the tweets? Um, so when I spoke about the study that was looking at Twitter, um, they did not look at the, um, the subject matter of the tweets. Um, they were just looking at um, general activity about like the, the size of the following of and the amount of activity that the Twitter users got if there was an association with the user's gender. So um, I don't know if the same... Um, trend in published literature is also the same case for um, tweets as well. So that would be interesting. Yeah, that would be interesting to know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anyone in the room have any questions? Yeah, another thing I I'd like to note before moving on to the next topic is I think that, you know, although this paper, like any paper doing something like this, has its own pitfalls. Um, I think the fact that it agrees with a lot of other literature, like similar to how you saw that the, the, the difference between clinical papers versus more basic science research papers was greater with clinical papers, that lines up with, with pretty much all literature that I know of about like the leaky pipeline in clinic versus basic science is even worse in, in clinical medicine and things like that. So in, in addition to a few other things that, that line up with like... Um, there were more papers published. I remember I presented a journal club about uh, COVID and things related to that, whereas, and they actually looked and said, saw that there was no real difference in, in number of people that studied COVID, similar to what you were saying about how they, they need to normalize to, oh, well, maybe more people are just in these high, high risk novel things, but it's probably not true, uh, at least from some other studies, so. I think that it, it lines up with a lot of other work and I think it's a valuable, valuable information set to have. So thank you again for your presentation. And uh, yeah, I think we can move on to Marie's talk. If uh, Marie, you can show your camera. There was one question from Andrew oh, that I just saw. Um, I just... 
you can take it. Yeah. Ed, how do you think as women trainees, we can improve our tendencies to use these positive words to describe our work? Um, that's a great question. Um, so what I would say is that I don't really know if there is an emphasis on you know, the connotations of the words that we use when we're describing our research. Um, and, you know, self-promotion can take different forms um, and these opportunities for self-promotion, um, they can occur more often and they depend on the discretion of the individual scientist, right? Um, and so it can be a really powerful tool to challenge stereotypes um, and it, it, you know, the perception of an individual performance, it's, it still is important in determining your career progress. Um, and it can be really critical when drawing attention to oneself in pursuing, you know, other opportunities and, you know, networking, collaborating. So it, it definitely does factor into this, the equation. Um, so I guess to answer your question, um, I guess as, you know, in different workshops that we have for trainees about how to give a presentation, um, it would be good to include this in that conversation too, um, that, you know, don't downplay the significance of your findings um, when you're talking about your research that you've done. Um, so it's, it is important that, you know, to own the work that you do um, and, you know, when placing it in the context of your field. Great. Thank, thank you for that answer, Nicole. And uh, I think that that will wrap up the question section um, for Nicole. So thank you again. And um, 